Well, a tough Indiana team is now in the rearview mirror. Time now to go for seven in a row. Rutgers played in the first college football game in 1869, beat Princeton 6-4. Newsflash, it's not going to be 6-4, and they're not playing Princeton. <laughs> well, you know what, guys? If we've learned one thing about Penn State football, if you don't like the first three quarters, stick around because the fourth quarter is going to be really, really special. And we've reached the fourth quarter of the Blue-White Tailgate season, which is coming up next. Welcome you to Blue White Tailgate, Steve Trey Todd. Jay will join us a little bit later in the show. Also, Mandy Nyad is going to join us later in the show as well. Penn State, tough one with Indiana. They won it. We'll talk about that in a moment. Coming up on the show, we'll take a look at the Nittany Lion offense and how they ground it out, the defense, how they played well late, and then preview Rutgers coming up. You know, we thought it was going to be a tough game because Indiana is a good team, not a great team, but a good team playing at home. And I think it says something that when you don't have your A game and still win, that tells me something. Well, especially like this late in the season and with all the injuries that we've had both offensively, I mean, more offensively as of late um, than defensively. But the fact is the kids played hard. You know, Indiana's a quality opponent. We talked about the, you know, their, their coach who's kind of really turned it around and you know, it's a great win, Todd, certainly. Well, let me first by saying uh, I'm impressed with your reference there. He, there's old school and then there's 19th century yes. old school <laughs> that Trey went for with that reference for 1869. Well done. Beautiful. Well done. And not only that, wearing the, the, the Tennessee checkerboard today. Yeah, yeah come on. Yeah. <laughs> he's, it's going to be a special show for Trey. He's, he's bringing it. But to your point, look, we talk about teams learning to win and learning how to finish. 24 points in the fourth quarter. A turnover for a touchdown that iced the game late. I mean, look, this team is doing all the things they need to do to keep that winning streak going. Down to 24-14, the Nittany Lions outscore Indiana 31-7 down the stretch to win. Our opening statement presented by the law offices of Alan Kirk. Head coach James Franklin on what swung it. Um, obviously, great team win for us. Uh, ball security was critical in the game. We talk all the time about, you know, that's one statistic that's never going away. Uh, ball security, turnover ratio. Um, you know, we had zero fumbles, which is something we had some issues with earlier in the season. We did have two, two interceptions. Uh, IU had five fumbles, you know, so two to five. That was, that was probably the biggest difference in the game. And it was huge because Penn State, even though they didn't take advantage of all of them, they either stopped Indiana drives or set up Penn State. Penn State got 14 points off the takeaways. That was big. Yeah. I mean, they have to – I mean, as you get up the food chain, so to speak, you know, big-time college football, certainly professional football, late in the season, turnovers are going to determine the outcome of the game. Double-digit def deficit, eh, what's that, right? Three, three times they've come back from 10 points or more, and you can do that when you create those turnovers and capitalize, which they did not do early in the game. I mean, they were, they were giving the you yes. know, Hoosiers wanted to give Penn State the game early on, couldn't capitalize, but when it counted the most, they did. Yep. Yeah, in fact, the second half, the only turnover Indiana had was the one at the end that led to the Torrance Brown touchdown. I thought the defense, Todd, I thought stepped up when they had to. Back to the wall, can't give up much more and didn't. Well, what experience they got when the linebackers were out. We've talked about Jason Cabinda and Brandon Bell coming back. What a difference they've made. But, you know, Brandon Smith, he's really stepped up when he needed to, right? That experience was just invaluable for him. And he's made some great plays to get the defense off the field, right? And you know what? He, that goal line stand, he's the one that knocked it down, almost picked it off of the goal line. Same end zone in 2004 where Penn State had the goal line stand. All right, time now for the update desk where Mandy Nyad is standing by. Thanks, Steve. Another wild, wild week of college football. The last time numbers 2, 3, and 4 all lost on the same day was 1985, when Michigan quarterback Jim Harbaugh lost at Iowa. Oh, the irony. Now let's take a look at your Health South Injury Update Board. The hits just keep on coming. Another big loss for the offensive line as Coach Franklin announced that Paris Palmer will be out for the season. Brendan Mann did not travel to Bloomington last week. No word yet on whether or not he'll make the road trip to Piscataway. 
And now we'll take a trip around the NFL for your Lions in the League update. Another big week for Allen Robinson, but not for the Jaguars, who lost at home to the Texans 24-21. Gerald Hodges had six tackles and an interception in the Niners' 23-20 loss in Arizona. And another stellar season for Sean Lee, who leads the Cowboys in tackles this season with 54. Honorable mention goes to Cameron Wake, who had three tackles and two sacks in the Dolphins' win. My star of the week goes to Keith Duncan, who, you might ask, he is the true freshman walk-on kicker for Iowa, whose game-winning field goal took down number three unbeaten Michigan. I can only imagine how Jim Harbaugh's Dockers have been in a rut all week. That's all from me. Steve, back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Mandy. So this is how it sets up now after the big weekend in the Big Ten. Here are the standings to the stage. You can see in the West, it's Wisconsin that has the advantage. They control their destiny in the West. They win, they're in. For Penn State, the road is this. It's amazing how standings make strange bedfellows. <laughs> Penn State needs to win out. That's their part. They need Ohio State to win out. Yes, Penn State fans are rooting for Ohio State. Even you. I, I am rooting for Ohio Even State. I don't you. like those people. I, you know, I've said this all along. I don't like them. Um, but the fact is, if they can help us get into the Big Ten Championship, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. I don't really care. I just want them to win out so to give us an opportunity. All right, college football playoff. It came out on Tuesday night. And the top four, Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, Michigan. That's how it shakes out. And you can see where Wisconsin is at seven and Penn State is number eight. But now the Nittany Lions have to take care of business. They have to take care of their own business. And Mike Kosicki knows that they have to go into Piscataway. And they have to block out all the noise. I think that Rutgers is an extremely talented football team. Obviously, it's going to be a great atmosphere playing there on Saturday night. They have uh, a very um, you know, well-known, effective, uh, smart head coach. And I think that, you know, they're a program that has a lot of talent and a lot of capability. And um, I think that, you know, they're going to play at a very high level. Over the years, though, it, when Penn State has played Rutgers, it's been Penn State's advantage. Let's take a look at the series to this point. And obviously, they've won the games in the Big Ten. Two years ago, though, they had to come from behind to win in the waning moments in Piscataway. So there you go. It's not going to be this week, Steve. <laughs> no. Well, it's, it's, we're not going to win in the waning moments. I think it's going to be a blowout, but it's just me. Right. Oh, no, you, that's one thing. That, uh, I'm glad that, that Todd's done a great job, I think, of drawing <laughs> you out over the years. You've been so shy. Coming up, we'll take a look at the Nittany Line offense. They had to grind it out and finally win it. More after this. They had to work hard all day for this one. In fact, of the first 42 plays that Penn State ran from scrimmage, 10 ended up in a loss. So that's how hard they had to work in this one. But they persevered because they were able to go up top finally, guys. When they went up top, it opened everything up. Well, they took advantage of some of their matchups that they had. I mean, Chris Godwin did a great job. And, and Trace McSorley is just showing how clutch this guy is. He only had like 16, 17 completions over 300 yards. They went for the chunk plays. And this offense is being known for chunk plays. Whether it's passing or running, they're getting the job done. Well, one of them happened to be in our Stocker Chevrolet Drive of the Game. Brought to you by our good friends at Stocker Chevrolet, located on the Better Pike across from the Nittany Mall. One of those plays is going to be in this sequence, and here's the Nittany Lions. Now, you set it up, Saquon Barkley gets going. If he doesn't stumble, he goes a long way. And then here it is. This is how you set things up. You send it up the middle. Okay. Now you're making them think. Let's go up the middle. No, we're not going to go up the middle. Flea flicker. That was awesome. That, I thought that was a great call. See, but you set it up. Notice yep. the plays that set it up. You, you Sometimes you do certain things, take a shot to set a shot, here, Barkley gets stopped, but on the fifth play of the drive, they will not be stopped. No. Okay? Barkley's like, excuse me, I'm, I'm running to Martinsburg. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I mean, and you, you mentioned the flea flicker call, and as a play caller, you get a feeling of, in a sense, when you want to do that. And up to that series, they really hadn't had a lot of success yeah. with Barkley. So once you had two plays in a row, hey, now we got them thinking that we're going to be successful with this run. Yeah. 
bam, coach called it, and it worked to perfection. And it swings momentum. That's what it did. It swung the momentum of the game. It was, Indiana didn't expect it. Yeah, no, I mean, it, th th those are the kinds of things where you know, you're going to look back, and it was kind of like the play that we had, uh, I guess it was in the Minnesota game, yeah. where we had that big pass from McSorley to, uh, Irvin I think it was, Charles. yeah, to Irvin Charles, right? And you say, wow, that's like a game changer. That one right there for Penn State. It was awesome. And it was a perfect guy to go to, too, also, because Deshaun Hamilton's not known as their deep threat. So he sold it really well by hesitating on his route and then got behind the safety, and there it was. And now we're at the point of the show. We're finishing sentences for each other. All right, here we go. <laughs> Time now for our player of the game. And Todd referenced it earlier. He talked about Trace McSorley. 332 yards, three yards off his career high. But he's our family clothesline offensive player of the week. When he needed to make plays, he made plays, and this is one tough guy. Yeah. Trey, I, I mean, you're a linebacker. How tough is the quarterback? He's he's really he's legit. I mean, you know, we saw him in preseason practice. I was very impressed with him the way he had command of the huddle. Um, he just doesn't back down. You know, he got really kind of knocked around in this game, but he just kept coming. And, um, you know, it's a tribute to him and the staff that uh, he, he plays as hard as he does. And keep in mind, in the opening drive, he's the one that took it home from nine yards out. He's just a tough, tough guy. He's, he's gritty. He's determined. And he wasn't completely healthy. I mean, he was banged up in this game mm -hmm. as well. And you could tell second half he was resisting to run the ball a little bit and give it to Saquon Barkley. But, yeah. He hung in there, fellas. All right, Dan. Part of the reason the offensive line jumbled to begin with suffered losses during the game. So let's take a look at the offensive line depth chart now. Remember, going into the game, it was Paris Palmer at left tackle, Bates at left guard, Gaia, McGovern, Chaz Wright. During the game, Palmer's now out for the year. McGovern got banged up in the game. That's your new depth chart right there. Coaches have to prepare for worst-case scenarios all the time. Penn State was prepared for this. They worked Ryan Bates at left tackle all week just in case, and it turned out just in case happened. Yeah, I mean, we are so thin right now, and, you know, we've been talking about this all year that, you know, the offensive line has really come together as a unit. I was getting a little concerned because it was like during the game that they were kind of like revert, reverting back to where they were last year. But it's because they've got so many guys. They're just mixing a match, and they got a bunch of young guys. Um, it's really unbelievable how um, uh, Matt Lamgrove has done a great job with the, with the, the kids. The be key before all that just might be Brian Gaia, the senior yeah. center right in the middle. Did a fantastic yeah. job. A lot of working p pieces around him to the left and to the right. But when you have a senior at center helping to lead that communication, it's going to keep those guys together. Yeah. And Mike Kosicki, is there a concern that you overcompensate because of the dominoes on the line? Yeah, I think that, you know, we have a next man up mentality for, you know, the guys that are, you know, the backups that are now going to be the starters or for the, the other backups that are now going to roll in and, you know, get some uh, quality playing time. So uh, I think that we have a bunch of quality guys that can go in there and be effective in the, in the run game, the pass game, whatever it is you know, for our offense. Is this the equalizer for Rutgers, though? up front uh no I, I don't think Rutgers I don't think at all I mean we have guys that you know from the blue banner play on the offensive line oh, and we're going to <laughs> literally take it to Rutgers regardless of how many guys we have injured I, I just it, it's not it's not gonna be pretty on Saturday Steve, night. I would have been happy to answer that question I really would have <laughs> yeah. been but I wanted to hear Trey's oh. response much more than I wanted to pipe in yeah. and give my it's Rutgers my take on it. it's Rutgers and I'm so glad I did yeah. Uh, by the way, Rutgers is giving up 248 yards rushing per game. Precisely. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for confirming that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a guy that they're going to have, I think, some trouble with, and I think he's been trouble for everybody all year, is Mike Kosicki. Creating mismatches. This is a guy right here who's too quick for a linebacker, too tall for a safety, and he knows it. I think that, you know, with, you know, strength, size, speed, um, you know, if you – kind of look at it you know linebackers will cover you sometimes and for the most part you know f faster than some linebackers or you know safeties will cover you but bigger than the safeties and can be more physical with them so uh, I think that's that's kind of what this uh, what the tight end position you know brings it brings you know obviously an additional um, you know help with with the run game but also in the pass game um, a guy that can create mismatches and you know help kind of get the numbers game going for your offense everyone talks about excitement level going to this game I'd say there's a lot of Jersey guys on this team. When you went back and played close to home, what kind of motivator was it? Oh, I mean, it was really fun. I mean, the only problem was, like, trying to get tickets to the game. And we, <laughs> we always played We always played the Meadowlands. It was 76,000, you know, old Meadowlands, and, uh, you know, probably 60,000 Penn State fans. So it was like you were kind of mixing and matching uh, tickets. But, uh, 
You know, I mean, the problem that Rutgers has and Chris Ash is going to have is the challenge of trying to get guys to stay home in New Jersey. That's always been the, the problem. And, you know, if you look at our roster, we've got a ton of Jersey guys. The, one of the Jersey boys you are, right? Yes, exactly. One of the, okay, we'll be at the game. We'll, we'll hook up. We'll see what's, <laughs> we'll meet some of your Jersey boys. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, Todd, you're asking for trouble. I just want to make sure you know that. Be careful, be careful what you wish for. The Nitty Line defense gave up only seven points down the stretch. We'll talk about them after this. As always, Indiana's a good offensive team. Kevin Wilson's always had good offense, and they challenged Penn State all day. And I, I was impressed by what I saw, but I was also impressed as the day went, Penn State, as the day went, kept the ball in front of them. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's like when you're playing a team that's going to throw the ball 35, 40 times a game, they like to play fast. I mean, you have to be good tacklers in space, and you have to keep everything in front of you. It's like... Um, it's kind of similar like in 86 against Who's, Miami. Hoosiers had them on the ropes. They we did. talked about Absolutely the short did. passing game. We talked to defensively. You just said keep it in front of you about the defense being patient, make the play. They forced some turnovers. The Hoosiers had them on the ropes, but they, they got up, yeah, knocked yeah. them out in the end. And the other part, too, is that and we mentioned this last week, Indiana's 126 out of 128 of scoring inside the 40. Well, the goal line stand was really the big moment as far as I'm concerned in the game. When you, that was a change right there that changed everything around. Brandon Bell is our family clothesline defensive player of the week, and what a game he had. Eight tackles, two and a half for loss, a sack, and a forced fumble. That's how you end up being the family clothesline defensive player of the week, and just the mere presence of him on that play there. <laughs> <laughs> Mitchell yeah. Page says, uh, not doing that. He, he's a very solid player, Steve. I mean, I don't think he's particularly flashy, but he makes very little mistakes. Um, obviously, this play right here was a huge, huge play. Um, but, uh, you know, he's a talented guy. He's tough. He's a leader. Um, and they play better when he's in there. There's no question. He's our family clothesline defensive player of the week, which then leads us to our hit of the week. And we just saw it. But you know what impresses me about the hit of the week uh, is not, of course, he does it, but it's the call. Yep. Hey, Brent Pry doesn't lay back. He mm -hmm. went after him. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and I think that Brett, you know, as, as the season has gone on, I think he's gotten more and more comfortable in the new role that he has. You know, you think about all the injuries we've had, the mixing, the matching, and I mean, I think he's done a, you know, outstanding job. Well, and just the execution of that tackle in general. I mean, he goes for the arm yep. as he's going for the tackle. I mean, he's not just thinking, bring the quarterback down for a sack. He's thinking, get the ball out of his hands and on the carpet. And great execution with Brandon Bell. Even if he doesn't make the play, number 11 is always lurking. He's always mm -hmm. close by, right? Even at the end of the play, you see he's right in position to, to make it. He's all over the field. It's amazing what the combination of Cabinda and Bell returning to the lineup has meant for this defense. Uh, sacks, Penn State attacking the quarterback. Todd just mentioned attacking the quarterback. Look at the Big Ten sack leaders to this point. That tells you a lot, the kind of pressure you can get on quarterbacks and what it can do for a secondary. Yeah, and the thing is, it's like they're spreading it around. It's not like one guy like last year with Nassib who, you know, was clearly, right. you know, the, the leader. He's, you know, they're mixing it up with the different guys and the packages that they have, and everyone's contributing. And that makes it difficult for a quarterback because you're not really yeah. sure where the pressure is going to come from. Exactly. I mean, if you have one guy, you can kind of key on that guy or maybe flow your, you know, your quarterback away from him. But if the pressure's coming from the right side on one play and the left side from the other or up the middle, it makes it really difficult on the quarterback to know where it's coming from. And Todd, how important do you think it would be to take away the running game from Rutgers and force them to win the ball game throwing it? Well, I mean, you always talk about trying to make a team one-dimensional. And, and you mentioned, you know, with, with Brandon's sack, Brandon Bell's sack, I mean, a lot of it is timing as well, right? Just keep the quarterback and keep the, the offense, the offensive coordinator guessing as to what you're going to do. I'm not so sure you have to do that this particular game against Rutgers. I think that we will be able to make them one-dimensional, and we'll see if they have enough talent at quarterback to get, it, to get the job done. They'll find out. They made a change in the Michigan State game necessitated, obviously, by the score. They took Giovanni Rochino out, and they put the, the freshman in who runs. I mean, he's a runner. He's a, he is a completely different kind of quarterback. So I don't know what they're going to do. We'll find out. Now, Christian Campbell says it doesn't matter who they're playing. Every phase has to be a win for Penn State to win the game. Uh, it's very, very important to stop the run. Um, it's very important to stop the pass game and the run, and very uh, important on special teams, too. So everything is important for us to stop. So. Kind of felt that covered it all. What about you everything, guys? Everything is important, and I love his hair. 
That's all yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Love his haircut. He, he speaks highly of your shirt. <laughs> 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 Yeah. But the defense has done a good you, know, you get five turnovers. Now, one's a special teams turnover. Let's remember that. Mm -hmm. the, the one where James, the ball hit him, and Christian Campbell recovered, as a matter of fact, set up the six-yard touchdown pass. But the defense created the other four, and that's been, you know, the, the complimentary part's been big. I think that kind of stuff is contagious, too. Yeah. When a mm -hmm. guy gets, hey, that's my first career fumble recovery. Oh, I got an interception. I mean, there's, you start to go ball hawking a little bit as a defense. That stuff gets contagious when you're like, He's got one, I want one too. And you're starting to think about, obviously, your responsibilities and, and doing with those things, but that little extra juice to get that football. Yeah. And, and giveaway takeaway means a lot. When you won the whole thing, now that, that we're talking about one of the truly elite teams of all time, I think you were a plus 24 that year. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, like, how we've kind of turned it around this year. I mean, just, you know, I mean, we're plus five. Rutgers is minus five. I mean, you wonder why we're, you know, the record we have in there, two and eight. I mean, when you start turning the ball over and you can't create turnovers, it's going to be a long season for you. Yeah, there's no question it makes a big difference. So we've been able to break down the Penn State offense and the Penn State defense. We're now going to make a trip into the film room. Jay's going to be able to break down everything for us as to what's going on. And so... At this particular time, we turn it over to the great one himself, Jay Paterno. What do you have in the film room for us? Coming up on the film room, we're going to take a look at some things Penn State has done this year, how they've adjusted the way people played them, and why they're on a winning streak like they are right now. Welcome into the film room brought to you by Letterman's Sports Grill and Gastro Pub. Now, it's safe to say this is a rebuilding year for Rutgers, but you know the expression, if you don't have anything nice to say, then say nothing at all. So let's talk Penn State. Yeah, we're going to talk about Penn State. You talk about rebuilding years for Rutgers. They played in the first college football game, which I think Trey mentioned earlier, and they've been rebuilding, I think, ever since. Uh, but we're going to talk about Penn State. One of the things we want to do today, I think this is a good week to take a look at some of the adjustments they've made and some of the things they've done within games and within the season to, to help them get on this win streak. So we'll take a look right, right now at the first graphic I want to show you is the run game has gotten slowed down at times uh, this year. And I know there's been some injuries in the offensive line, but there's been some things that people have done to scheme. If you look at the first half of the Purdue game and the Indiana game, uh, 43 carries, 92 yards, only 2.13 a carry. That's not a good number for a back like Barkley. And one of the reasons is people have started to kind of scheme in on some tendencies. Now, we'll talk about what they've schemed in on, but we'll also talk about some adjustments that Penn State's made to handle that. When you look at the alignment of the back, one of the things that everybody teaches is where is that running back? And here, he's even with uh, McSorley, the quarterback. So there's a chance there that he's going to run the football. But also by being static, you allow the defense to make their calls based on where they know the zone read is going to come from. So when Barkley's over here, they know if they're going to run that zone read with the quarterback, it's going to come to this side. So now this defensive end is able to play the quarterback. They run blitzes and stunts inside to handle it. And you'll see how well this works for Purdue here. And this is from the first half of the Purdue game. You get a cross blitz inside. Defensive end is playing the quarterback. Hands it off, and there's a lot of bodies there, and they stuff the run. Now, the other thing people have done when, the bat, when Barkley is lined up here, again, even with the quarterback, and he's static, which means he's not motioning in from, from anywhere else, they still started to, to, to block the wideouts up. They lock them up, and now they're taking away the short throw on the run pass option, forcing them to throw the ball over the top, and this defensive end is able to react inside out on McSorley. You see how well they do that here. So now McSorley really doesn't have the, the, the screen throw out there. They Take away Barkley inside, he keeps it, now that defensive end reacts. Now, second half of the Purdue game made a good adjustment here. They started to take Barkley and motion him across the formation, across the quarterback. And when you motion him across the quarterback, now your zone read read is different because you, you think it's going to be over here, now it's over here. Not only that, they didn't take him on an outside sweep, and that now they can't lock in. So take a look how effective this is. So now, again, you see he motions across, now he comes back, they hand the ball, now they're running outside. Purdue's expecting something inside. So that was a good adjustment. Another thing that people have to go is, is they start to have to get the quarterback run game going again. Last four games, McSorley's only averaged about two and a half yards a carry. He'd been doing much better than that early on. Ta and now take a look at one of the, another adjustment they've made here. Again, now they line up with Barkley in the same spot, which gives these guys his own read key, a run key, and they throw him a screen out. 
Take a look at the video here and you'll see how effective it is. They're sitting inside playing run. The wideouts do a great job on the, on the perimeter blocking, and now you throw a ball out there and you get 16, 17 yards. Those are big, big plays for you in a game uh, when you make those kind of adjustments. And to show you just example how something, something as small as just a minor alignment, here Barkley is aligned on a third and six ahead of the quarterback. So now these guys know not going to be a zone read, probably not a run, and take a look how well Maryland can lock in on us in a key third and six in the game. Those guys play pass all the way, and that's going to be something that's got to improve. Now, when you take a look at Penn State's pass game, we'll take a look at the next graphic. Offensively, they've got to do a better job passing. They're throwing a lot of 50-50 balls. They're below 50% completions in the last six games. Third down's only 25%, but they are averaging 19 yards per completion, which is a big number. Defensively, we've given up a lot of things in the past game as well. The last couple games, 63% completions. Take a look at where people are attacking them. They're going to go at these linebackers. So here you see, uh, you're going to see this tight end come in, get over the top. Good pass protection. Take a look at that, and we'll see the video. But you see, they send the guy in the flat. The outside linebacker widens, and they isolate Kabinda underneath and get over the top of him. Now, Again, Penn State, we talked about making good adjustments. Here's the second half of the Purdue game. They show a blitz, get this guy convinced that he's got the short pass. He actually engages and drops out. Take a look how effective this is. He's actually engaging the offensive lineman. The quarterback thinks it's a hot blitz, throws it to his hot receiver, and Smith knows exactly where to go to make that interception. Key, key thing for that in the game there, turn that game around, broke it open. The last thing we'll talk about is how much, how much improvement Penn State has made against against the run game. Cabinda does a great job here. The jet sweep hurt him against Pitt. It hurt him earlier in the year, but watch the reaction here now. He's going to see this, see the ball handed off. He's going to accelerate and make a great tackle in the open field. And again, that's a major improvement for Penn State off, uh, defensively against the run game. Yes, defense has gotten better against the run game, but still giving up some plays in the passing game. Yeah, and if, and if you get into a situation, I don't think, you know, this week I don't think Rutgers is good enough to take advantage of those things, yeah. but Michigan State may be able to, and if Penn State gets in the Big Ten Championship game, they're going to play a team. Offensively, Penn State done some really good things in the run game, gotten better, but they've got to make sure they can't let people kind of scheme in on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got to get a little bit more consistent with the short pass game. They're hitting a lot of deep balls, um, but, again, you can't live on that all the time. All right. I know you all be watching. Stay with us, we have more Blue-White Tailgate coming up next. Welcome back. Whenever we get to this segment, we talk to a variety of people, some national, some local. Rich Scarcell has been a beat writer that has covered Penn State for more than 30 years. Mandy Nyad is with the Reading Eagles' Rich Scarcello. Thanks so much, Steve. He's been with the Reading Eagle since the year I was born, 1986. How awesome is that? Rich Carcello, welcome to the Blue White Tailgate. How are you, Mandy? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. And let's get right into the hottest topic this week, the college football playoff rankings. How big is it that Penn State is number eight? Well, I think it's important, uh, first of all, from a practical standpoint, uh, Penn State now is in good position to possibly move into the top four if they win the next two games against Rutgers and Michigan State and, and, and win the conference championship game, uh, I think they have a shot to make the, the national semifinals. At worst, it, I think they would end up in the Rose Bowl. But So being number eight is big in that respect. As far as the program, being back in the top ten for the first time in seven or eight years is uh, and, and, and considering everything that Penn State football has um, endured over the last five years, I think it's very big. Um, I think a lot I've heard from a lot of people who are very excited about this team and about this particular six game winning streak. When you walked out of Heinz Field earlier this season after that loss to Pitt, did you ever imagine or see this coming? Well, Mandy, I'll go one step further. Uh, I was impressed with them after the Pitt game despite the loss. It was after the Michigan game two weeks later, walking out of Michigan Stadium after a 49 10 loss. And there were a lot of us walking down to uh, the postgame area wondering uh, if they were going to reach six wins, that it was going to be really difficult. Be considering the way they played, considering all the injuries they had, especially at linebacker, and for Penn State to make this run is, is truly uh, remarkable. 
Now, earlier in the season, Coach Franklin was on the hot seat. It's his third season now. Is this truly his program? I think with the fans, he might have been on the hot seat, but I don't think he was on the hot seat with the, the two people that matter, and that's President Eric Barron and Athletic Director Sandy Barber. And I've always said that he, no matter what, that he deserves at least four seasons and probably five. I wanted to see what he could do with players that, a roster made up of players that he's recruited. And you're seeing, I think, the results of that. They're a very young team. Um, they've got to improve in, in several areas. But I think you're seeing what this team is going to look like over the next two or three years. Yes, and the offensive line hurt again. They've had to move through the depth chart. What are your thoughts on Michael Mennett and Will Fries being kept as red shirts or not? Well, I think James Franklin addressed that this week, and, and it was good to see that he discussed it with those two guys and, and their families. And if they have no problems with it, um, I, I, think, I don't think it's a bad idea. Again, not having seen Will Fries play, I, I saw Michael Mennett play in high school a couple times. Uh, are they better than what they have available? That's the question they have to ask. Are they markedly better? But if they feel that they are, and I think it is worth it to play them. Uh, if you lift the red shirt and play them, and I think that that's another key. If you lift the red shirt, you must play them. You can't just play them one or two plays. You must play them regularly. Now tell me, what did we learn from watching this team last week in Indiana? We didn't learn anything that we didn't already know. We know that they, this is a very mentally tough, resilient team that continues to persevere and I wrote a column earlier this, earlier this week that uh, no player embodies that better than Trace McSorley. Uh, he again showed you how tough an individual he is mentally and physically, uh, how many hits he absorbed last week, and he kept getting up and, and, and led what was really uh, an astounding 31-7 to score in the final 16 minutes of that game. So I don't know if we learned too much about them that we already didn't know that this is a very tough team. Saquon Barkley has been in Heisman candidate talks as of late. Did his 58-yard performance last week in Indiana put a dent in that? I think it does. I, I, I thought he had an outside chance to get invited to New York. Um, I think unless he puts up really, really big numbers over the next two games, possibly three, that he'll probably not get invited to New York. But he, he's had a terrific season. And and it, the, the offense with him as so – he, he and Trace McSorley as the leaders of this offense, uh, it's been a big difference since last year. Um, you know, it's a, that's obviously with the addition of offensive coordinator Joe Moorhead, that's been a, been a really great decision by James Franklin to bring somebody in like him. Speaking of the next two to three games, say I want to book my flights now, what are your predictions for the rest of the season? Well – <laughs> That's a good question. I think we're all in that boat, uh, the people who cover the team, trying to figure out and sort through everything. I think they'll win the next two games, and I think they'll be 10 and two to to win the regular or to finish the regular season. Will that get them to Indianapolis for the Big Ten championship game? Most people think that Ohio State will beat Michigan, which means that with two wins, Penn State would get to Indianapolis. I'm not convinced yet. I, I think, Michigan could give Ohio State trouble. But uh, I think if they finish 10-2, and two, um, their Penn State is going to be in a really, really good bowl game, which I think would uh, only be appropriate for this season. I know we're all looking forward to how this season pans out. Thank you so much, Rich, for joining us. Steve, back to you. Mandy, great job as always, and our thanks to Rich Scarcella for carving out a few minutes of time to be on the show with us today. Coming up, we'll take a look at what we'll break it down and get trade comments as we continue after this. All right, Rutgers, new head coach Chris Ash now running the show at Rutgers. They lost their opener at Washington, then they had back-to-back -back wins over Howard and New Mexico. Haven't won since. I know you have a high opinion of the, uh, of the Rutgers program. I, I, not that I don't, I don't like Rutgers. They're just not a very, very good football team this okay, year, and I think we're going to beat them by 50. That's all I'm saying. This is our Rutgers segment, right? 
Yes. I, okay, I'm going to try not to be overconfident because I know you don't want your players to be overconfident, but it's hard not to be overconfident and start thinking about like a pre-Thanksgiving feast, you know? Yeah. I mean, we got to see once to dissect and we're going to talk about some players, but the fact of the matter is Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State beat the Scarlet Knights 185 to nothing combined. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, they've been in some games with Indiana, with I guess they lost to Illinois 24-7. And they played Minnesota tough. So you wonder what team is going to show up for senior night at home. Yeah, except for Michigan, they've actually played, we all know, much better at home. I mean, there's no question about it. Iowa, for example, is a 14-7 game. Mm -hmm. But that was a while ago. That's the problem. It was a while ago, and it's a different cast of characters. They still had Jadarian Grant. That's been a big loss for them. We'll talk about that in a moment. Chris Ash brought him in from Ohio State, where he was the co-defensive coordinator with Luke Fickle. You can see his journey that has taken him to this point to be the head coach at Rutgers. They're hoping he's the guy that can get it done for them. And let's get now to the Rutgers offense. Let's look at at the Rutgers offense. When you look at the Rutgers offense, you can see all the numbers where they rank and so forth. You can see based on their team stats what Jadarian Grant meant to what they wanted to do in their offense. Rushing, receiving, kick returns. They had a lot of what they wanted to do built around one guy, and that one guy isn't there anymore. Yeah, and I think it's shown. I mean, the fact is the kid is probably their best player. He goes down, he's not involved anymore, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, they're throwing goose eggs up on the scoreboard. That'll rip your heart out quickly when you lose a guy like that because you don't have anybody to go to in those down times. You're looking around going, okay, we can always count on this guy to help us out, but when he's not there, that's an empty feeling. Well, I remember in 2000, Penn State had a lot of things built around Eddie Drummond Mm -hmm. early on. Then Eddie Drummond, I think, pulled a hamstring before the opener, and all of a sudden you had to shelve what you had to do because you had a lot built around a speed guy that could make some plays for you, and it kind of changed the tone of the first couple games of the season. Sure. All right, so that's a look at the Rutgers offense. Let's talk about the quarterback. Giovanni Rochino had been on the scout team, impressed them, and because he impressed them, they made him the starter. Now, the running backs, Martin, Hicks, Goodwin, and Goodwin's the guy, probably the best receiver of the group. I mean, they're not bad running backs. Well, no, Martin, I mean, yeah. And Martin's a Harrisburg kid. For, yeah. uh, forgive me, Trey. He's a Harrisburg kid, so we kind of keep a watch on what he was doing. He was productive early in the season. Really hasn't been utilized much in the last couple of games. So we're going to try and do things by committee, and it's experimental time, right? For the, you you right. just got to expect just about everything. It's senior night. They've got nothing to lose. Yes. So play calling-wise, expect some crazy stuff. Personnel-wise, you're going to see some people asked to do things that maybe they haven't done all year long because they are in the experimental phase. At Rutgers. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're asking the freshman Jawan Harris, by the way, to be the, the grant role. Andre Patton gives them some deep threat. Uh, no question about that. Now, the Rutgers defense. Let's take a look at their defensive numbers so far. And you see the pass defense, fourth <laughs> in the Big Ten. But there's a reason for that, <laughs> all right? Because the rush defense is 14th in the Big Ten. People have not been as inclined to throw the football. That's why why these stats can be weighed one way or the other. Look at the great pass defense. There's a reason. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. If you if you depend, you know, you, you're defending like four passes a game, like in, in, in modern college football. I mean, the fact is that they're just go running downhill on them, and I would be shocked if Penn State doesn't have a huge game rushing the ball against them. Oh, guys, come on! They're hanging their hat on that statistic, and you're taking that away I, from them. I, know. I would say it's because Chris Ash was a former defensive back in college, and they have a is that right? Superior is that what you're going with? Okay, it's <laughs> you're right. You're just, it's because <laughs> you run the ball all over. They did get Darius Hamilton back this year. He's changed his number from 91 to 75. Why? He's paying tribute to his father, who played for the Giants as number 75 for a dozen years. Linebacker, they've had a lot of injuries at linebacker. Trevor Morris is their leading tackler. Anthony Shafi in the secondary has eight career interceptions. Mike Kosicki says no matter what, Penn State has to enter the game with respect. That way they can go through and take care of business with respect. The easiest way to win a game is kind of to take it from the start. And, uh, you know, you've kind of seen us do that um, a few times this season. And then you've also seen us, you know, kind of, you know, go the other route and kind of gut it out throughout the entire game. So, uh, you know, for us to go in there and start fast and stay fast, um, I think that we've kind of perfected, not perfected, but, you know, at a high level of starting fast. Now I think that the next step for us is, you know, continuing to play fast. Yeah, Penn State has scored on their opening drive for the last five games. The one they did was Ohio State, and they missed a field goal. Yeah, I think it's especially true on the line of scrimmage that you can build momentum early on. 
if you can show that you can dominate your opponent right in front of you, offensive line or defensive line-wise, I think that really plays big. And if Penn State can do that when the running game, because we expect them to run the ball, that's going to really open things up quickly. Coming up, the good, the bad, the ugly, as we continue on Blue White Tailgate after this. Veterans Day weekend across the country and saluted in Bloomington. And well done, by the way, I might add. And we salute all the veterans. We thank you. And we thank your families, too. Yeah. Families have made a lot of sacrifices sure. for all of us, too. All right, let's get to the good, the bad, and the ugly. And Todd has a really, really good one to start with. I do have a good one, guys. It's the Penn State chapter of uplifting athletes. They're holding their pledge drive this weekend against Rutgers, okay? You can go to the website on your screen, pledgeit.org slash PSU16, and you donate per touchdown. Be careful how much you donate. They are playing Rutgers, but be generous and donate to Pledge It in the Uplifting Athletes chapter. So I'm doing the bad, and you know what? The whole ranking thing, right? You've got the AP poll, you have the coaches poll, you have the USA Today poll, you have the New York Times liberal, you know, <laughs> Gray <laughs> nonsense poll. The only thing that matters is the CFP because at the end of the day, they should have one poll at this point in the season, and it should be the CFP. The rest of them, get rid of them. Ugly is simply this. You can't pick a start time for the Michigan State game. This has nothing to do with Penn State. They're out of it. It has nothing to do with Michigan State. It's up to the TV networks to pick. You can't pick 12 days out. Look, this isn't the Manhattan Project. This is... <laughs> Pick a start time. Michigan's playing Ohio State at noon. Play the game at 3.30. Done. Meeting's over. Let's go out. Get a brunch. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you have to be kidding me. All right. That's the ugly on this one. All right. Let's get to picks. Speaking of ugly, here are the pictures to go with the records <laughs> to this point. Am I really six games back? Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Well, I get to start with Washington State and Colorado. It's going to take place in Boulder. Washington State actually have balanced their offense more this year running the ball. But I really like Mike McIntyre's team. I think they play really tough football. I'm going with Colorado. You've got San Diego State, Wyoming, and Laramie, 7,200 feet above sea level. Yeah, well, I don't know how I got this game, but I mean, I, I, again, luck of the draw. I, yeah, luck of the draw. Give Trey like the that's lame because, game, the lame, the lame game. That's because Todd, Jay, and I got here first. <laughs> I think San Diego State has too much offense for Wyoming. They're playing at home. It doesn't really matter. I think uh, San Diego State plays well on the road, and I think that they beat Wyoming at home. I get Oklahoma, West Virginia. They're always tough in Morgantown, but I think you guys are going Mountaineers, so I'm going to go Baker, Mayfield, and the Sooners. They always do enough to make you think they can compete this time of year. Jay, you have USC, UCLA. A great rivalry, two storied programs. I like UCLA in this, not because I think they're going to win, but because I'm rooting for them because Tom Bradley's their defense coordinator. But UCLA has got one of the top pass defenses in the country. They're starting to find their stride in offense, so I think UCLA is going to pull off the upset in the Rose Bowl on Saturday. Keys to the game, win the turnover battle. Don't give them any hope by opening the door. My keys to the game is can Penn State dominate the rushing game early on and can Saquon Barkley really take it to Rutgers? I look for the short and intermediate passing game. I think Rutgers is going to sell out to try and stop the run. We've got a banged up offensive line. If McSorley can complete a lot of passes early on, it'll take that heat off of that. That's a good point. I mean, taking some pressure off of them, and that's how you can do it with the short, efficient passing game, which kind of can take a couple things out of the equation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there you go. Penn State, Rutgers. High Point Solutions Stadium, Saturday night at 8 o'clock. Looking forward to that as the Nittany Lions go after their seventh consecutive win. For Jay, Mandy, Todd, Trey, I'm Steve. Thanks for joining us on the Blue White Tailgate Show.